Okay, uh, this segment I'm going to cover DC machine as motor and as generator. So you can operate it in either mode. Later on, we will deal with the DC motor next week. So let me just go straight to it. Now, uh, for generator, essentially you are making use of the motion. Okay, you need to rotate, rotate the motor in order to generate uh, voltage or current. So the uh, current is here, right? Generated by rotation, and we need to have uh, fuel as well as sorry, we need to have force. This is mechanical force. This is magnetic field. So these two um, combined will give you the EMF or the electrical output. So we are generating electricity in the form of induced EMF, induced EMF um, in, in terms of current or voltage. So remember the FBI, okay? So for generator, for generator, you need to uh, combine mechanical motion. This is mechanical, that's the force part of it. And this is the magnetic, magnetic field. So with these two combined, you can generate the EMF or the electricity. So uh, when that happens, current, current here will flow, all right? And then if you have a load, connected to the electrical circuit. Just imagine this is like a battery, right? So over here, this is like um, battery, which we generated via the mechanical rotation of the shaft. So, but of course you need to provide the field here, the magnetic field. So in the presence of magnetic field with the uh, current, uh, sorry, with the uh, uh, conductor here uh, under rotation and due to Faraday's law, magnetic, uh, electromagnetic induction, current will then be generated, or EMF will be generated. So in this case, is the current. Of course, the voltage is there. This is the induced EMF. The induced EMF, uh, we use capital E, to symbol uh, to uh, as a symbol and this is generated EMF so we use G here to represent so when the rotation uh, begins the conductor here cuts the flux which is provided by the field here right the B field and then current is generated uh, with the induced EMF here and if the circuit is connected you get current flow so this is the induced current and uh, depending on whatever load you have here <coughs> you, you can have a bulb uh, an iron to generate heat uh, aircon or motor or what have you right so so basically the idea is that we want to generate electricity and we want to generate a DC generator. So this is like a battery if you like. And so uh, the potential is there, but if you connect, let's say a circuit to it, then current will flow. So we call this the armature current and we call this generated uh, EMF, the EG. All right. So now the field is basically the magnetic field. You have the North Pole and the South Pole. North Pole and the South Pole. And of course you can use permanent magnet, but uh, most likely we will, in our case, we use another DC source here to uh, generate the, the, the field, the magnetic, the magnet. Lah. So then you need another circuit here, which is providing the field current. 
So when a current is passed through, remember some sort of a core material, you pass a current through here, you will actually generate a magnet as a result, not south pole. So, but of course, if you use permanent magnet, then you don't need another circuit. That is why this current here, the fuel current, and the induced EMF which we generate is a different uh, current altogether. This is our armature current. This armature current is what we generate. What we generate, right? This field current here is to provide for the magnetic field source so that you have a field because the, in, the important ingredient is that you have to have a magnetic field and you have to rotate or provide the motion, the mechanical motion in order to get the electricity or the induced EMF. So this is for generator. Now we are going to look at mo very quickly because moto uh, we will not cover in this segment uh, but still we need to know. So in the case of moto it's just a reverse. We want to generate mechanical motion or rotation. We want to generate rotation, but we need uh, electricity to make that, make that happen. And the field is always there. So you need to have the field anyway, whether you are generating or you are motoring. Okay, so this is always there. The field is always, it is always an ingredient or a must-have item there. Then, uh, if you provide a current coupled with the magnetic field, then you get the mechanical output or mechanical motion, the force. So this is the case for uh, moto, okay? And of course, moto is very useful. You can you can move things. You can uh, uh, power the air conditioner, you can provide motion, you can in fact like uh, the trains are actually driven by electrical motor. So motors are very very useful, right? So the way it works is that first you have to um, provide armature current in the armature coil of the motor or, or rotor, this is the one that rotates and in the presence of magnetic field, north-south, flux uh, is being cut, if you like, right? Um, and with these two ingredients, you, you provide armature current, and then you have magnetic field, and then the motor will start to rotate, right? So we generate the mechanical force or rotation so this is for uh, moto this is for moto now let me go on eh, because we actually are really talking about uh, okay so uh, looks like i can't go back unfortunately uh, never mind let's let's go on i i meant to show you um the previous slide but uh, never mind so oh yeah this is the previous slide uh so the e E B, which I was talking, so we are talking about this E B. This is the E B, right? This is the E B that I was talking about. So whether it's E G or E B, the equation is the same. Okay, let's go next. I think I generator. Okay, in the next few slides, we are going to establish the equations uh, for uh, induced EMF. Okay, the equations for for induced EMF. So let me just write down very quickly uh, what equation we we want to introduce. And this equation is in a formula page. So as what we have seen for generator, we have induced uh, EMF or generated EMF. And for motor, we use another uh, uh, subscript called B, back EMF. This one, you, you will understand why we call back EMF rather than motor. But it turns out this 
induce EMF, okay, whether it's due to generator or motor, uh, is in fact same equation. So we will learn about this equation shortly. Let me just write down first. So like I said, this equation will be in the formula page. So in a way, you don't need to memorize, but it's good to know or memorize if you can so that uh, it's easier for you to solve problem. So we are going to prove this equation if you like. Okay, EG is equals to EB and is equals to Z divided by C times N times P times flux. This is this is flux, uh, phi if you like, divided by sixty. So, uh, so this is a very important equation because we will use it many times. All right. So uh, now let me just go back. Scroll to the. Oh, okay. So we are back here. So uh, now, so we are going to prove this equation, like I said, right, for both generator and motor, and our starting point is this equation. This equation here, you don't really need to know, but it's the basis, uh, based on this equation, we will then derive what we need to know in this uh, EG and EB, which you need to know, okay? So if you can follow the derivation, that's fine. If not, you just take it that, uh, you need to know this equation and all the parameters and how to make use of this equation. That's all, right? So for derivation, really, it's good to know. Provides the background of why we have this equation in the first place. Okay? So let's get to know uh, this equation. E conductor. This is the induced EMF per conductor. Okay, we are just talking about one. One conductor means this This is one conductor, right? There are many, many conductors uh, in, in the winding, uh, in the slot, slot of the armature or the rotor. So we just consider first, what is the induced EMF for just one conductor? And later we can multiply to the total number of conductors we have. Okay, so B is still... Um, the flux, the magnetic flux density, okay, the magnetic field, like, if you like, or in other words, is flux density. And we will look at uh, just one pole, right? So typically, motors could be, or generator could be two pole, four pole, six pole, and so on. So, but in this case, we just look at one pole. So this particular pole is the south pole or north pole, doesn't matter, right? doesn't really matter. North pole, of course, where flux uh, uh, originates, then it will end up on the south pole. So the generator is rotating with uh, N. This is the rotation uh, in revolution per minute, RPM. So N is for rotation speed or speed of rotation in RPM. Now, so uh, L is the length of the conductor, right? So imagine this is the motor. So then you have many, many uh, conductors in the slots, right? In the slots. And so this L here is talking about the length of that conductor or, or um, in the presence of the magnetic flux field, right? So this is L, and then velocity meter per second is, of course, linked to the N, which is the rotation, the speed of rotation. So, so this equation here, like I said, you don't have to know, but it's going to lead to uh, EG and EB, which we require. So I'm going to go to the next slide now. So this is the, the derivation. So based on this equation, once again, now first thing we need to uh, express the velocity in terms of omega r. 
omega is the angular velocity because we are talking about the uh, roto right roto is like a cylind cylinder and is rotating so uh, the angular uh, velocity omega is um, uh, more relevant in a way right so n is the speed of rotation r is the radius of the armature this is the radius of the armature L is the length of the conductor. And omega R, you, you, you learn this from ANGMAC, eh? correct? I uh, hope you still remember ANGMAC. So V is omega R. And omega is 2 pi N divided by 60 times R. Okay? So uh, there, there, there are quite a few things here, la, but I don't want to dwell on it. But just... Let me just carry on. Huh? So area of pole, area, area. Now this area here is talking about the area of the magnetic field. Huh? Remember, B, B is flux per area. See, uh, so let's say this is the area and this is the flux. So the density of the flux or the magnetic field is defined by that flux divided by the area. So of course, if you have very strong flux uh, within a certain area, the field is very strong. The flux is very strong, right? A lot of flux. So we need to divide by A. And A is... Uh, um, because the the flux, remember the 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 pole, the pole is uh, here. Let's say you you can have four pole or you know two pole. Let's say four pole. Uh, the way I'm drawing here is four pole, north south, north south, uh, south here, uh, north here, and south and north and so on. Right. So the flux will flow. Uh, this way, uh, this way, this way, and that way, right? So, um, so this flux, okay, is is going to, is going to uh, uh, go like this, and but we are looking at the flux, the the area where the flux actually penetrate, like if you like. So this is actually. Uh, this is actually the circumference, right? This is the circumference. Circumference is 2 by R, right? Circumference. And multiply by L. Multiply by L here. So it's like the surface of the cylinder, like we, right? I'm talking about that's the area where the flux actually penetrate, right? So that's why it's 2 by R times L. 2 pi r times l, so that's the area, but you divide by p because uh, it depends on how many poles you have. So we look at the cylinder, we take the whole uh, surface area, but we divide by p, which is number of poles. Let's say you got four poles, you divide by four, right? So we are looking at just the area per pole, area per pole, just one pole only. So with this A here expressed in that uh, terms, now we can then express B as uh, this, okay? So uh, flux divided by A, A is 2 pi R L, 2 pi R L divided by P. So P actually goes up. So this is our B. So this flux here is only for one pole. Bear in mind, uh, this flux here is only for one pole. That means here only. Right? This is the pole we are looking at. And now we are ready to substitute into this equation, uh, which we base on. So the EMF for one conductor is the B. Right? We just plug in the B here uh, times L. Okay, maybe I, I, I start from here easier to see. So... Uh, B, we have expressed in terms of flux and the number of poles. 
in terms of the radius, in terms of the length of the conductor. So that's B. Multiply by L. L is just L. And V, we have expressed, right, previously in terms of the speed of rotation and the radius as well, right? So with this um, expressed in that way, we can cancel out quite a few things. 2 pi cancel out, r also cancel out, and then l also cancel out. So what's left is uh, n p divided by 60 multiplied by 5 which is okay here so this is one conductor the emf for one conductor and it will lead on next slide which will establish uh, this equation which we need to apply this is the equation really that you need to know and apply so what is uh, multiplied to is this factor here this factor here remember uh, we have already found the e conductor this is the e conductor for one conductor emf for one conductor and but the total emf of the generator is actually uh, the emf for one conductor multiplied by the total number of conductors total number of conductors and that is given by z divided by c so if you still remember z is the total number of conductors right use c is the number of parallel paths so z is the total number of conductors c is the number of parallel paths so it really depends on whether it is lab or lab winding that is or it is wave winding wave winding if it is wave winding if you recall there are only two paths which is fixed two parallel paths whereas if it is lab winding the number of parallel paths depends on the number of poles okay so let's take the easiest one let's say the wave winding wave winding just means the conductors will contribute uh, the total emf all right that way and then all the currents will add up so this is the emf for one conductor this is one conductor so because it's is wave winding is two parallel paths so the total uh, generated emf all right is due to the sum of uh, the individual emf due to each conductor but over one parallel path because well it's parallel circuit so the voltage is the same right for both paths so what you need to do is to add up all the voltages contributed by the individual conductor in one path that is all that is why uh, this number here okay is actually total number of conductors divided by uh, the number of paths number of parallel paths and this will give you the total number of conductors in one path that is why we multiply okay e conductor with this total number just for one path understand so if it is lab uh, you just divide more lah, right divide more because it depends on p also if p is 2 then of course it's the same as wave if p is 4 then it's different p could be 6 8 10 and so on but for wave uh, it's always 2 just bear that in mind all right so we managed to establish this very important equation uh, let's move on eh? now another very important uh, relationship which you need to know so these are the the two very key uh, one is equation the other one is 
uh, proportionality. These two you must know, must know very well as well. So how do you apply the second uh, relationship here? E.g. proportional to N and flux. Well, it's, it's quite simply this, because if you look at this equation, okay, E G equals to Z divided by C times N P divided by 60 times flux times flux. If you look at this equation, you recognize that um, quite a lot of constants there. This is a constant, 60 never change, changes. And Z and C is also constant for a given machine, right? So let's say in the factory, this motor has been, or this generator has been manufactured. You already fixed the number, total number of conductors. You also fixed the winding. So C is also fixed. And of course, you have to decide how many poles you, you, you want to design your uh, machine to be. So that's also fixed. So the only two things that are not fixed is the flux as well as the uh, speed of rotation that depends so hence uh, we can then write down this uh, re uh, relationship that is or this proportionality eg is proportional to uh, n times flux so based on this uh, proportionality we can solve quite a few questions lah. okay so just bear that in mind so these two uh, one equation one proportionality very important you need to know that let me just go on okay let's look at one example then you will know what I'm talking about uh, example 3.1 we have a lab wound lab wound machine okay it's a generator DC generator lab wound so since it's lab one, no, then we know straight away C is actually P la, right? And then P is four, they tell you that. So you can write that down. And it has 52 slots. And each slot has 20 conductors. So that tells us, okay, total number of conductors is going to be 52 slots times 20 conductor. And that will give us uh, 1,040 conductors. Flux per pole, this is the flux per pole. Uh, if you like, this is the flux uh, per pole. Per pole. This is quite small, 0 0.01 Weber. Now we are asked to find the speed of rotation, which is N, in order to generate 250 on no load. So how do we go about finding the speed? Right, N. N is the speed. Now, definitely, we will need to use this equation. Eg equals to Z divided by C times NP divided by 60 times flux. Quite a lot of things we already have, right? We have flux this is the flux we have p right p this is p p is 4 we have c c follows p right in fact you can see they will cancel out and then z we also have z so everything we have what about uh, eg we need to have eg because the only thing we don't have is this n which is precisely what we are supposed to find right so, uh, it's good to sketch the circuit so that you can visualize uh, how to plug in the values. Because it says no load, so if you sketch the equivalent circuit like so, all right, I think, I'm not sure whether we have uh, introduced this, maybe not, but never mind, we will soon introduce. Uh, it goes like that. So... So this is our generator. This is our generator. Uh, generated due to mechanical rotation. So there is the EMF there, the induced EMF generated. And this is the armature resistance. 
So current will flow when you have a load. Currently, there's no load. So you don't expect current to flow. That means armature current will be zero. Okay. Um, in that case, they tell you uh, you are able to generate 250 volts. Actually, what they are telling you is EG is 250 volts. So if EG is 250 volts, we also have this information. So in other words, everything we have, we should be able to find N. N is just uh, EG, which is 250, multiplied by C, which is P, which is 4, divided by Z, which is 1040, multiplied by 60, divided by P, which is 4, and divide by flux, which is 0 0.01. So you can find uh, N. N is going to be, uh, let's see, uh, N is 1442. 1442. RPM. Alright, so that's the answer here. Let me just go to the slide and see what we have. Actually, yeah, we have provided the solution. So we have provided the solution and that's the answer. So let's look at um, the circuit now. Okay, just now we have not touched on the circuit, but now let's look at this circuit here. So this is our generator, DC generator, uh, so-called separately excited, right? Remember, FBI, we need to have F, we need to have B in order to generate the induced EMF or the induced current I. So FBI. So, uh, and here it says, the, f the field uh, the field is separately excited. Look at the field here. So the field here is by itself separate from the armature, the generator circuit, if you like. The armature circuit is here, right? The armature circuit is here, but the field is inside. So the field is actually separately excited. Okay? S dot e separate separately excited so the field uh, the function of the field of course is to provide the b la. so the field is actually here it provides the b the flux the flux right and then the force okay the force is the rotation right you have to rotate in order to generate uh, uh, electricity you must provide some sort of mechanical prime mover the input that rotates you know whether you are using uh, uh, water right in that case is hydro or you're using uh, LNG which is gas you fire fire the turbine and then this thing just moves or you just somehow have to provide that uh, uh, rotation, that that make, that prime mover. So it can be wind. I mean, wind is like, or it can be even tidal and etc. and etc. So this is going to convert mechanical motion uh, or mechanical energy into electrical energy. Now, let me um, go on. We, we are going to express this uh, model uh, into a circuit. This is more or less in circuit form. What we're doing here is we are plotting the open circuit la, characteristic. We call it OCC. Um, that means we don't really connect. There, there isn't any load here. There's no load here. This is usually the load here. R load. Right, whether you connect a bulb, a, a fan, uh, a motor, etc. Uh, this is, but right now we are just measuring it. So it's open circuit, open circuit. We just measure 
we want to measure how much the generator outputs uh, as voltage lah, right when you change the speed or you change the the field so that's the purpose here okay uh, so what's this going on okay procedure so we connect the circuit and then we drive the the roto uh, the armature roto and armature the same uh, with a certain speed using a prime mover in fact, you can use another motor to be the prime mover. That is actually what is going to happen during the lab. Because we are not going to use LNG or water, water hydro, wind and so on. So the most convenient prime mover in the lab is a DC motor. So we use motor to drive the generator to produce electricity. Yeah. Okay, make sure you understand that. Now, increase the fuel excitation current, IF. This will increase, of course, the B. La. B will go up, more flux and so on. And you expect, uh, of course, EG to increase, la, correct? Because remember, EG is proportional to speed and flux. The fuel here, of course, is uh, flux divided by A. Okay, so increase fuel current. You increase fuel current, increase the magnetic field, you increase the flux, ah, right? So when flux go up, then of course EG goes up. If you turn faster, N becomes faster, N goes up, then EG goes up. So uh, let's plot, ah, see what is the effect of the fuel current on the generated EM. So as you expect, fuel goes up, right? If you increase the fuel current and you expect the generated EMF to go up. But of course, it's not linear. It's not linear. What you are seeing here is it depends on how saturated, how saturated the magnetic field is, right? So at first, it's okay. At first, it's quite uh, proportional, quite linear. So this part here, this range here, is quite linear but as you increase more and more flux you can see it gradually uh, saturates quite clearly um, you, you cannot go beyond certain value lah, because no point you keep increasing because this this is going to like kind of a plateau becomes flattened so typically we keep to this range try not to uh, go near the saturation point or you know near saturation uh, this point just means there is some residual magnetism even though there is no fuel current but there is some uh, residual as long as you have some flux right you may get some uh, EMF right that, that is what it's saying here so let me go on so from the OCC, the open circuit characteristic curve, when fuel current is small, uh, there's some residual EMF. Fuel current increase, e.g. increase linearly up to the knee. Beyond this point, uh, you are approaching the saturation. And so e.g. increase more slowly and so okay this curve looks like the bh magnetizing curve not surprising lah, because we we are doing similar things here in a sense we increase the magnetic flux right so this is what bh does uh, so now how about the speed how does the speed come into the picture Previously, we kept the speed constant. We just increased the fuel. But now, supposing the speed is increased, right? Or decreased, depends. So if you start off at this speed, then later uh, you drop the speed to a lower speed, what happens to the EG? Well, as we expect, because EG is really proportional to both the speed and the flux. So if flux, uh, I mean, if the speed goes down, then of course EG will go down, right? 
So then that's why you can see here, if you compare these two OCC curves, uh, uh, with the lower speed, uh, you find uh, overall uh, the 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 basically the EG will drop, uh, EG will drop, right? So you can also compare for the same flux. Uh, let's say you look at this point here, you keep the flux at this point, you compare the effect of the speed. You can see lower speed, uh, lower uh, generated EMF. Okay, so uh, now since EG is proportional to N and, and flux, right? If we keep the flux constant, we just want to examine the effect of the speed, the end on EG. Then what you do is uh, you can uh, write down this uh, uh, ratio here. You can, based on the proportionality, you can formulate this, uh, what you call this uh, equation here, based on two different values of the speed, but same value for flux. That means you keep flux uh, constant or unchanged. So in that case, you might as well leave out the, the, the flux or the fuel, right? Because it's not contributing. There's no effect on it. Uh, so actually, uh, another thing is that this is the original proportional relationship. Then we say, okay, EG we know, based on what we know, EG is like this, right? But because the flux is dependent on the fuel current, you can replace the flux with the fuel current. Understand? Because with more fuel current, uh, the magnet is stronger, the flux is higher. So it's a proportional relationship. Uh, you can see that if you keep the fuel constant, then you might as well leave out the field because uh, it has no effect at all since you keep it constant. Okay, so then uh, EG is just proportional to N. So uh, ultimately, it comes down to here and you can find a new EG value uh, given these three values here. You can calculate for a new EG value. That is... If you have an old set of uh, reading, given a speed, n speed, you have EG1. If, let's say, the speed increases, then what happens to the new EG? You can use this basically approach. Lah. Oh. Okay, I think I'll cover another example and that's it. So, uh, 3.2, 4 pole, 4 pole and lap connected. So in other words, C is equals to P equals to 4. And separately excited, it has 51 slots, 12 conductors per slot. That tells you the total number of conductors is 51 times 12. Okay, let me check what is that value. 51 times 12 is 612. And N is driven or the the generator is rotating at 900 revolution per minute and the useful flux per pole this is phi is 0 0.025 we are asked to calculate eg and the armature resistance ra is 0 0.06 so okay first things first this one is second part already huh uh, um, let's find the EG first. So EG, e, EG is Z, which is 6, 1, 2, divided by C, which is 4, times N, which is 900, times P, which is 4, divided by 60, times flux, which is 0 0.025. EG is uh let me see yeah two two nine point five two two nine point five volts so the first part we calculated 
Now the second part it says, what happens if you increase the speed? Let's say now n is one thousand instead of uh, nine hundred as first. So typically, if you have two speed, this will be n one. Then the second speed, the new speed is n two. And it further says if there's a load of ten ohm connected across the armature, the field current remains constant, which means I F one is equal to I F two. So there's no change at all. What this means is E G proportional to N flux proportional to N I F is actually just proportional to N. Which uh, previously we have already uh, covered that part. So uh, if you want to find uh, the output power, all right, the new output power with this load, with this new speed. So first thing we got to find is what is the new generated EMF EG two, use the proportionality here. First, we find okay, E G two divided by E G one is equals to N two divided by N one, right? Which previously we have done. So therefore, E G two is E G one. E G one is two two nine point five times the N two is thousand. N one is nine hundred. So E G two is two five five, two five five volt. This is E G two. So we 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 have found the new uh generated E M F, but actually the question is asking what is the armature current and what's the output power. So this is uh something a bit more indirect lah. Then some more there's a load here connected to it. But the start, uh, the the key parameter that you must know is what is E G two first before you can calculate the others. So let me go on. All right, uh, right. This is the solution. Okay, so we have already found previously. I've shown you what is E G one, and then based on. Constant uh fuel or constant flux, which is the same thing, right? Fuel and flux is the same. Uh, you you can basically ignore this part, and so we find the new EMF, uh, induce uh generated EMF two five five, and okay, so this is where the circuit becomes, um, uh, relevant. Right, you have um, basically a series circuit. It's just it's just a series circuit. The field you can kind of leave out because it's separately excited. Uh, so if you have E G two, right? According to K V L, this is like K V L all over. Uh, basically, so E G two is armature current times. The armature resistance, and it's the same armature current, and then our load is ten. So to solve for the armature current is just simply that, very straightforward. And if you want to know the output power is I square R, you got armature current, you got load resistance, boom. So it's done. Okay, so I think I'll stop here. And hopefully, uh, okay. I think we are almost reaching the end of this topic. This more, ah, uh, this is just formula page lah, right? So like what I mentioned, E G and E B, they are the same. Doesn't matter, same equation. And this is important relationship. Later on, we will encounter another proportionality, which is also important, right? And then we'll talk about power. Uh, power is basically omega times the top, ah, uh, developed top. That one we'll cover next week. So that's it, class. Thank you. See you.